aware that we're dealing with an urgent clinical need, even in our patients with relatively mild epilepsies, and certainly in our patients with severe epilepsy. And now we're fortunately at a time of genetic explosion, um, and we have now an ever-increasing genetic knowledge. Still a lot to be done, but we've at least uh, made a big start. And genes are important because they allow us to then really get down, drill down to the disease mechanism, allow um, our laboratory colleagues to perform disease modeling experiments, and then to test novel or repurposed therapeutics. And then we as epileptologists need to think about how we can translate these back to our patients to see if they actually work, and if they do, to implement them. And our eye has to be on the ball all the time. And the aim here is to improve the outcomes of our patients' lives. So I think this urgent clinical need really relates to all of epilepsy. But um, I want to focus on the most severe group of epilepsies where the, the, the need is urgent and severe and these diseases are, are, are really devastating. And these are the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. Now, I know many of the uh, paediatric neurologists will be well across what this means, but I always think it doesn't hurt to go back to what we mean by this phrase. And I just want to spend a few slides thinking about an epileptic encephalopathy that we defined in the ILAE Classification Commission as where the epileptic activity itself contributes to cognitive and behavioural impairment beyond that expected from the underlying pathology alone. And here I like to show as my background, a typical slow spike wave EEG signature of Lennox Gasto syndrome. And we all know that these patients tend to have this very frequent, if not continuous epileptiform abnormality. And that of course impacts on their abilities to develop and to function. So in a way, this epileptic encephalopathy is a triad of seizures, epileptiform activity, and critically impact on development, be it slowing or regression. And just to take that apart one by one, many of these patients, or almost all, but not quite all, present with uh, seizures, and they often, but not always, have multiple seizure types. They may have an explosive onset, such as the child with myoclonic atonic epilepsy, or in fact, a more gradual onset, as we see in Dravet syndrome, where they present with one perhaps hemiclonic seizure, and then a month or two later, they have some more, and then eventually they have other seizure types. In some of these uh, syndromes, they may just have one seizure type, such as absence seizures with eyelid myoclonias. And this can occur in people without an encephalopathy, but often is seen in people with an encephalopathy. And of course, critical seizures are not essential. And the um, prototypic version of that would be landau kleffner syndrome. Then in order to have an epileptic encephalopathy, you must have epileptiform activity. Now that might seem self-evident, I'm sure it does, but occasionally people get this diagnosis and they've never had epileptiform activity on their EEG. So one does have to think about it critically. And there are these patterns that we all recognize as epileptologists, hypsarrhythmia, slow spike wave, uh, multifocal discharges. And this EEG, this epileptiform abnormality may occur at certain times in life or they may, and may occur all the time or just part of the time. And the third and very critical part of this diagnosis is the preceding development. There, there must be an impact on development. And this can occur in the setting of either normal development or delayed development. And that development may plateau or regress. And this can be much more difficult to detect in an abnormal child or adult. And that's where we need to listen to families because they'll be able to say, look, they're not as good as they were. And they may be able to explain to you how that, how that would be. And this impact on development is often secondary or following a big seizure, say a prolonged seizure, pardon me, but it may also be with infection or brain swelling or vaccination, for example. So just to look at the same idea in a picture of form, here's a little girl at 21 months. I met her. She was having a seizure every five minutes. Um, she had very frequent epileptic activity and her development was abnormal, but she regressed markedly. 
And you can say, well, why have you spent the last three minutes describing this concept to you? And it's because it's so important. There may be something that we as doctors can do to fix it. For example, if they have a structural etiology, and um, if you look at this MRI, you can see multiple tubers in a child with tuberous sclerosis, and you can go to surgery with that child and determine which of those tubers are epileptogenic and they are resected, you can abort this epileptic encephalopathy process and the child's cognition can develop. Equally in the genetic space, if you have a potassium channel abnormality such as this one, KCNQ2, um, and then you give the child the right drugs such as a sodium channel blocker, carbamazepine or phenytoin, you can certainly improve their outcome. So in our 2017 classification of the epilepsies, we, we enlarged the concept to make it a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, though you could just have an epileptic encephalopathy. But just to say many of the children that we see and adults have both developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And this is because the developmental impairment actually is secondary to the underlying cause, for example, a specific pathogenic variant. On top of this, you have this epileptic encephalopathy process. Um, and then once you find a gene, we need to very much understand that spectrum of phenotypes that go with that gene and also the wide range of comorbidities that is common in these children and adults. And now I think one has to think about it in terms of both a gene name, such as the little boy in the picture with KCNQ2, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, but you also need to know his syndrome in order to know how aggressive to be with treatment. Now, with all of these uh, syndromes now, we recognise that quite a number of them actually have associated movement disorders, uh, such as the boy on, the, on your left with STXBP1, and he's got very prominent hyperkinetic syndrome with dyskinesias and a figure of eight stereotopy. The girl in the middle has cerebellar features in the setting of a KCNA2 disorder, and this little boy on the right has a hyperkinetic movement disorder with Dynamin 1. So just a moment to pause and say, these children and adults have very severe disabilities, and they, it's not just about the seizures and development, it's also often about behaviour, gait, gut abnormalities and sleep abnormalities, and of course a host of other possibilities, uh, such as respiratory and cardiac, to name some bone problems. So if we were going to get towards precision medicine for these diseases, we would want to cure all of this, not just seizures. So within the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, we have a host of epilepsy syndromes. Some are very more, more common, not very common, but West syndrome, Drave, Lennox, Gastro. Some are much rarer, such as epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. Some are more focal, such as Rasmussen. But there are plenty of children who don't fit into a neat box, a neat syndrome, such as those beginning under three months of age, some in infancy and some at any stage of life, including the progressive myoclonus epilepsies. So let's think about etiology, and we now know of more than 300 genes that can lead to a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, and these genes evoke a whole lot of different cell biology processes uh, that can lead to this sort of outcome. But, you know, finding the gene is not just the answer. And that's because most genes have a broad phenotypic spectrum from self-limited epilepsies to very severe developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And so you can't just go syndrome equals gene because that's, it's much more complex than that. And most genes will have this spectrum. And if you look at my favorite gene, SCM1A, at the mild end, it, in, it causes genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures, plus some people just having typical febrile seizures. But at the severe end, it has the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And it doesn't just cause one of them. The best known, of course, is Dravé syndrome, but it can also cause this very severe uh, early infantile DE and other syndromes. And then if you look at it from the other side and you say, well, let's just take this syndrome epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures 
and you go there, what about there? Well, this is from a review I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail, but 33 genes can lead to the syndrome. All right, so that's sort of a long introduction. And now we're going to go into what do we actually mean by precision medicine? Well, until now, we've sort of had a model of one size fits all medicine. We take a bunch of patients with epilepsy. We might go down to focal or generalize, but that's about all we've done. And uh, you try their new, this new drug and it works for some, does nothing for others. And for others, it has adverse effects. So with precision medicine, the whole game changes because you find their genetic cause, you tailor the treatment to that genetic cause, and you see if it works in those individuals. Now, I want to walk us now through a whole number of different ways of thinking about precision medicine, because I think they should all be coming into your thinking uh, in 2021. So let's start with the very beginning and how genetic knowledge in actually already today informs your thinking around how to treat the patient that you're seeing. And so I uh, want to talk about our um, study, which was a large international collaborative study looking at the genetic landscape of in epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. And this is a rare syndrome. Um, the pediatric neurologists will know it, the adult ones may not, because it's rare, but it's where you have ictal migration from one hemisphere to the other, begins under six months of age. The children get, the babies get very frequent seizures that escalate to status epilepticus, and they often have profound global developmental impairment. So in our study of 135 patients from all over the world, we had the, at the time of study, they had a median age of three years, 10 months, with a median age of seizure onset of four weeks. Um, onset we only took below six months because that's when this syndrome starts, but it could have begun on the first day of life. And in fact, three patients were thought to have had in usual seizures uh, and their actual out of utero or they, after they were born, their postnatal onset was between day one and two weeks. And we found a group of genes had onset in the first week of life uh, fairly reliably. Just to show how severe this is, 95% of the patients had to severe to profound impairment. And you see here my little boy with the early infantile SCM1A, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And here you see a little girl I look after with WWOX, a recessive cause of this disease. They all slowed with drug resistant seizures, but to our surprise, we actually found a few that um, had better outcome, including two that were normal, which were, was a real surprise. In terms of their associated features, I just wanted to show this for a moment so that you understand how severe this syndrome is. 30% had spasticity, 12% um, scoliosis, um, more than a quarter had a movement disorder. Um, and half had microcephaly, and a few had very impressive thermal dysregulation. This disease has a very, or this syndrome has a very high mortality rate, with a third having died at a median age of two years, seven months. But uh, one of the, the oldest is one I'll show you in a moment, who was 12 years. And these are the causes of death. None were reported as SUDEP. Um, but I, I suspect they could still die of SUDEP. And of our cohort, a third that were alive are still under the age of this death, of our median age of death. So, you know, we still don't know what the future holds for them, sadly. So the aim of this study was really to look at the genetic landscape. And what did we find? Well, uh, we found that of the individuals that were solved, and we could solve two thirds of these patients now with next generation sequencing, 72% had a range of dominant genes. And the biggest player here is KCNT1, a potassium channel gene, uh, followed by SCN2A, uh, which uh, was with that little girl I showed you in my first uh, picture describing a development or an epileptic encephalopathy had. Uh, but you can see SCM1A is also here and another a uh, number of other uh, receptor genes. Um, in terms of other inheritance patterns, we had um, a few genes that were excellent, CDKL5 and PIGA. And then 
I think this is an important message. We had a quarter of our solved patients actually had recessive causes. And we tend to think about that in, in consanguineous pedigrees, but we don't tend to think about it as much as we probably should in outbred uh, families. And they can, by bad luck, be homozygous, homozygous for the same uh, mutation. But of course, they can be compound heterozygous where the parents each have a different pathogenic variant of the same gene, and then the child can have a recessive disease. And this is the whole picture with a third still remaining to be solved. So for the young people listening, there's still a lot of work to do to solve this syndrome. And really finding the gene, I like to say, is the beginning of the answer. So one of the small sidebars I wanted to talk about was around the inheritance of these. And we've talked about these obvious recessive excellent and dominant inheritance, but a very important issue is that of mosaicism. And mosaicism is where you have two populations of cells, the mutant cells and the normal cells. And we found indeed that this girl um, who died at the age of 12 years and was profoundly impaired, um, she had um, mosaicism with 34% of leukocytes carrying the pathogenic variant, and yet she was just as severe as any of the heterozygous children. We also had a patient with a GABA-G3 mutation uh, who was mosaic. But that's when you have the child that's a mosaic. What about the parents? And we had uh, in this study, three of the children with KCNT1 had mosaic unaffected mothers. So an important um, thing that we need to think about as clinicians is if the parent has had any seizures at all, febrile seizures or any seizures, that's a little red flag to say maybe that parent is mosaic and maybe they're only 10% mosaic. So otherwise they're completely normal. Two of our patients had inherited um, the variant in a dominant way from non-mosaic unaffected fathers, uh, but those mutations were definite because they were recurrent pathogenic variants associated with sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy, which is the new name for autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. So I just wanted to um, use that as an entree to mentioning this. And your worst nightmare for these families is not one child with a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, but two. And we did a study in 2018, now three years ago, with Heather Mefford's group, where we looked at 120 families where we had a child who was thought to have a de novo pathogenic variant uh, in the setting of a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And what we uh, found when we looked at both the mother and the father of a trio in detail 200 times at mum and at dad, we found that actually 8% of 120 patients had a parent who was mosaic. And what that means is those parents are at risk of this scenario that you can see in the picture of having two affected children. So this, I think, has really changed genetic counselling. And it means that if you have a child with a seemingly de novo pathogenic variant, you need to ask the geneticist to look at it very critically. Um, but perhaps the lab can actually study both parents uh, in their blood to see if there's any evidence of mosaicism, but also to look at the next pregnancy. So now that um, I want to just talk then from genetic knowledge to how diagnosis actually should change your management today. And already I think it helps us to think about changing our anti-seizure medicine selection to find a precision medicine. And just a nice example, not very old, 2018, but also it happened last month in Australia, both in different parts of Australia, very good pediatric neurologists same story started seeing this child this one had seizure onset just after five months shown by the red lines the neurologist started levetiracetam didn't seem to be doing too much child was having hemiclonic seizures what did the neurologist do start oxcarbazepine what did it do it's pretty clear there isn't it and um, this is because the neurologist had missed or not thought about the diagnosis of 
Dravet syndrome. And yet again, it happened last month, somebody rang me about a child. So I think this is certainly not front and centre of people's mindset. When you're seeing a four-month-old or a five- or six-month-old baby and you need to be thinking, could it be Dravet syndrome? So that leads me to, does the specific sodium channel channelopathy matter in, in your care of the patients today, this week, in your ward? And the answer is clearly yes for SCM1A, where you get so seizure exacerbation with sodium channel blockers and you shouldn't use carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine, and there's some debate around lamotrigine. On the other hand, if you have a different sodium channelopathy, SCN8A or SCN2A, um, you can have, a, they are often in the early infantile form due to a gain of function. So in fact, sodium channel blockers are great for these children and you want to use carbamazepine, phenytoin or oxcarbazepine. And in fact, this week, I had a little one-year-old who had been put on levetiracetam and I'm just uh, become involved with the family and we just got an SCN8A uh, pathogenic variant this week and we're studying her straight away on carbamazepine and we'll, we'll swap her over. So the disease now, so that's really how the, making a genetic diagnosis can inform your choice of therapy now. Um, but what about um, other more specific genetic, uh, well, precision medicine approaches. So let me show you Tom, who I met when he was three years old. He'd been pretty well until then, and he presented with focal status epilepticus. And then over the next few weeks, he had very frequent uh, long focal impaired awareness seizures. This all occurred in the setting of a, a normal boy apart from mild speech delay when he developed single words at 18 months, put two words together a bit late and walked sort of just at the, uh, just above the normal age. His first routine EEG showed ox, captured an occipital seizure and, um, and, and temporal discharges. So what do you think Tom might have had? This is also a very important diagnosis in 2021 because if you make that diagnosis, there is now a precision therapy. Well, I hope that's given you enough time to make the diagnosis. And he presented with CLN2 disease. And despite his parents being outbred, they, he had a homozygous TPP1 mutation, which severely disrupted normal splicing of messenger RNA. And this resulted in um, a deficiency of tripeptidyl peptidase 1, which is a lysosomal enzyme. And this is, of course, a lysosomal storage disorder. And I'm sure many of you will be across this New England Journal uh, study where they looked at enzyme replacement therapy using solipinase alpha intraventricularly. And here you see Tom having the, uh, soli the solipinase alpha infusion. And in this study, they compared fortnightly intracerebroventricular solipinase alpha against the um, natural history of this disease. And you can see a striking efficacy. We're using this enzyme replacement therapy. And Tom and his family actually moved to Rome to get the therapy because it was only available in four places at the time. And my dear friend, Nicholas Specchio treated him. And this is when he came back to Australia. And he has fabulous parents who lobbied our government to get it on our health system for all Australian children, which costs $500,000 a year per patient of Australian dollars, which at the moment is a bit weaker than the uh, American dollar. But anyway, you need to have the families working with you to get these sorts of um, very life-saving disease uh, therapies available to people. So now let's move to that all important question of gene therapy, because that's where all the hype is. And is there hope as well as hype? So let's think first about loss of function. Um, and when you have a pathogenic variant causing loss of function, it seems pretty obvious what we need to do is increase function. And you can do that in several ways. You can take the wild type allele and increase its expression. 
If you find the pathogenic variant is having dominant negative effects and affecting the function of the wild type protein, you need to perhaps block this dominant negative effect. The, another option would be to take the mutant allele, um, such as a truncation mutation, and use one of the drugs that can skip the truncation. And there's a lot of interest in antisensor oligonucleotides, which is where you can modify the pre-messenger RNA splicing to promote increased production of the protein. So let's turn back to uh, one of my uh, most uh, fascinating disorders, I think, is Dravet syndrome. And as you know, 90% of, well, in our studies, actually, 90% of patients have pathogenic variants in SCN1A. And that encodes the alpha-1 subunit of the sodium channel. And this is uh, forms the pore through which the sodium ions pass. And this is a loss of function disease where the patients have haploinsufficiency. So um, there is an approach being taken uh, by Stoke Therapeutics, and this relies on upregulating the normal allele. So if you look at this uh, normal um, allele, it makes both uh, messenger RNA that goes to make the SCM1A protein, but it also has nonsense-mediated decay exons that uh, target some of this uh, messenger RNA and make it non-productive uh, for destruction. So the aim here would be to make less of the uh, destroyed uh, messenger RNA and more of the good stuff. In the person with Dravet syndrome, they have a mutant uh, allele, and so half of it goes for destruction with the non nonsense mediated decay exon working. So you have mutant non productive messenger RNA, and then you have mutant messenger RNA, and no protein is made. So the idea of Stoke is to use a system called Tango, targeted augmentation of nuclear gene output. And what they have made is an ASO that targets this normal non-productive -product, splicing with the idea to make more of the regular messenger RNA and therefore more protein. So it like, sounds like a great idea. Does, does it actually work? And here you see the data from Laurie Ison's studies in the mouse model of SCM1A. And uh, this mouse has um, an exon 1 deletion of uh, SCM1A. And you can see here in red that they have the normal, um, or the normal, the abnormal, the Drave mouse. And they've used a sort of a placebo ASO, which uh, is a non-target control. And you can see that the irregular Drave mouse, uh, more only 20% survive more than about 30 days. Here you see uh, in black the wild type mouse. And here you see the Drave mouse, uh, who, which has been given the ASO, and its survival was almost as good as the wild type mouse. And then they looked in more detail to see was there actually an AV1.1 protein, which is the outcome of the SCM1A. And you can see here in the wild type mouse, you have uh, the one with the placebo um, control uh, ASO, and you can see a normal amount of NAV1.1 expression. And then in those given the ASO, the actually mouse had a greater uh, than the normal amount of NAV1.1 expression without ill effects. Then if you look at our mutant mouse, given the placebo there's only just over half the amount of NAV1.1. But with the ASO, the amount of um, NAV1.1 is almost as much as your wild type. So pretty compelling data. And Stoke Therapeutics have just uh, recently taken this to human trials. Um, I think they tweeted at the beginning of the year that they have put their first dose in man. It might have been the end of last year. So that's one approach. The other approach in Dravet syndrome is using the adeno-associated viral vector. Um, and the idea here is rather than our AS, I didn't mention the ASO probably needs to given, be given every three to four months long term. We don't know the absolute answer to that. That's what I think. But here is a different approach. You're using 
one dose of gene therapy to try and cure the disease. And you remove the viral DNA and use it as a vector in which you put the DNA of choice and then hopefully get it to the neurons. So Encoded Therapeutics is the company that is championing this approach, and they have developed a, um, an engineered transcription factor transgene. And so this is a zinc finger DNA binding domain uh, fused to a transcriptional activator domain via a uh, short linker sequence. And this DNA binding domain recognizes a unique DNA sequence upstream, upstream of the SCM1A transcription start site. And what they have done is developed a cell selective gene regulation therapy. So they're not trying to replace the gene here, they're trying to upregulate it in a cell selective manner using AAV to get the um, the, the sequence into the, um, into the cell. And the other thing that they're doing very, that's very important is att attaching this regulatory element that recognize, recognizes uh, GABA, GABA cells, GABAergic cells, so that they can precisely upregulate SCM1A expression within the target cell, which is GABA, GABAergic inhibitory into neurons. And these are the cells that we know are not functioning correctly in Dravet syndrome. So um, you can see here uh, that with this regulation, um, the AAV9 uh, vector is uh, placed into the episome and this transcription uh, leads to regulation of the uh, regulatory element of the promoter in the GABAergic cell to produce more of this engineered transcription factor that upregulates uh, and makes more SCM1A in the cell. So at the moment, uh, there's not a lot of data out, but the, um, the company is certainly looking towards uh, human trials, suggesting that they have very promising data. So on the other side of the fence, um, what about gain of function? And here, in a way, it seems easy, but I think it's almost harder because you need to block the gain of function. And the aim is to restore the... Um, the protein to normal levels of function. But of course, there's this challenge about decreasing the patient's uh, levels to a loss of function phenotype. And I think we also know that different proteins work in different cells. So we want to block it in the right cell, in the right network, and at the right time in development. And that's even more challenging when we think about how much development in, occurs in utero before we even know that there's a problem. So let's turn back to SCN2A, the alpha-2 uh, alpha subunit of the uh, sodium channel. And you can see all these different phenotypes have been associated with SCN2A. But the early onset ones, the ones beginning under three months of age, are gain of function. And the later onset ones are loss of function. And they don't all have epilepsy. So you may have an SCN2A uh, epilepsy, uh, sorry, you may have SCN2A pathogenic variant and have intellectual disability or just autism spectrum disorder without epilepsy. And you can also have um, a mild self-limited phenotype. And I want to focus now on one of the gain of function uh, phenotypes, this early infantile developmental and epileptic encephalopathy secondary to SCN2A. And there is a recurrent variant, the R1882Q, which has been seen in several children with this disease. And my colleague, Steve uh, Petru, and his very talented uh, postdoc, Geza Baraki, have studied um, this particular mutation in vitro. Um, and you can see here the wild type, and here is the mutant. And they've looked at action potential firing through the dynamic clamp model and showed marked gain of function. So Steve and his team then went on to develop a mouse with this exact mutation, this recurrent mutation. And they showed that the mouse had a strong seizure phenotype from postnatal day one. And you can see a very severe mortality with almost all of them dying by postnatal day 22. 
And then they went on to design a GAPMA ASO that targets this mouse SCN2A. And the aim here is to reduce it, this gain of function and restore it to normal levels. So does it work? And here are the data. And you can see um, here the untreated mouse in black. The gray shows the mouse that has had a control ASO, a scrambled one. And here you see two different doses of the ASO, and you can see a far better survival in those with the higher dose uh, ASO. And I've taken this from a poster presented in 2018, but this paper is now on bioarchive. So it shows that ASO mediated knockdown of SCN2A rescues the disease phenotype in the gain of function SCN2A DEE mice. So I want to move on then to just one other thought around this, which is about the pathway. And in many ways, I think that we can all see it's going to be very expensive if we're going to try and design a precision medicine for every gene, particularly since I've just told you there are 300 genes for the development of an epileptic encephalopathies, and there are many others for other um, epilepsies as well. So perhaps we need to think stand back a bit and think about a pathway approach such that one treatment could help multiple different diseases. And of course, one place that immediately comes to mind is the mTOR pathway, where we know a whole range of different genes can result in a range of um, uh, malformations with the most common in our practice being focal cortical dysplasia. So this raises the question, could the mTOR inhibitors be used for these um, very important group of epilepsies? Um, and you'll remember that many of these patients may have normal imaging, such as those with the GATE one complex with DEPDC5, NPRL2 and NPRL3. So you may not have a malformation. They may not be a surgical candidate or they may have many malformations or they may have a major malformation and not be a surgical candidate. So we desperately need other other, other uh, drugs. So are we there yet? Can we rest back and say it's all done? Well, we're a long way from there yet. And, and one of the important steps now, and I think tantalizingly exciting, is that translation to patients. Does it work? And then if it does work, how can we go about implementing this for our patients? Well, I'd like to say it was easy, but really there is a chasm between uh, mouse and man. And I've just shown you some very exciting mouse data, but now we need to take it to our humans. And here's one of my delightful little girls with Dravet syndrome. And what's needed? Well, there's a lot of work and a lot of dollars that need to be spent to take us from mouse to toxicity studies in primates to show these drugs are safe and then to safety and dosing studies in man, followed by efficacy studies in man. And then if they work, we need to implement them. And that involves also um, questions around cost and the economics of this. And obviously they're very expensive. That's why I told you about the CLN2 treatment because uh, I don't think we all stop and think how expensive is this therapy gonna be? We want it, but how are we gonna bring it to our patients? And then also the long-term outcomes, you know, we don't even know if you give an AAV, AAV therapy now, will it have consequences down the track? So um, I, in closing, I wanted to say that precision medicine in the epilepsies is, is really already upon us. And it should be something that you think about every day in the clinic. Um, we need to think about molecular diagnosis, and I know that not all regions of the world can get that now, but where you can, it's really important, and there are programs in some countries or many countries now where you can get uh, molecular testing for children under about five years of age for free. And um, that is exciting because if you get a diagnosis, such as the patient I saw this week with SCN8A, we've just made the diagnosis, it will change treatment now.
And it will and so if you get a gene diagnosis, I think it behoves you to go and look at the literature and see if there are particular drugs that might make a difference. So for example, uh, in the, about last year, we published a paper on PCDH19 girls often respond, responding quite well to levetiracetam. It's not always the case, and that is not really a precision therapy, but there is data out there that can inform you with the treatment you choose. I wanted to spend that bit of extra time on the mosaicism question because reproductive counselling is so important. And I saw a little boy last week, his mother came along with her, um, the in vitae panel actually already showing that the mother is mosaic and she is 39 years old and wants a second child and has quite a severely affected first child. So it's incredibly important, particularly with paediatricians to be, to be thinking about their next child. Will they have more? Are there risks? Often people are told it's de novo, you have no risk. And uh, you want to make sure you help them to understand this issue of mosaicism. Making a diagnosis also informs your ability to look for comorbidities, you know, which syndromes and which diseases actually have cardiac issues. Maybe they have an issue of prolonged QT syndrome you need to look at or, or something like that. Um, and we need to keep our eye on the big, big, the big aim here, which is not just seizures, it's disease. And so one is diagnosing the comorbidities. The second one is thinking about these novel therapies that actually could treat this, the actual disease. But we need to do it in a very thoughtful and scientific manner. So that means double, well, you can't usually do double blind in these things, but they do have mechanisms whereby they might do a blinded first introduction of the drug, a randomized trial, and then they might give the ASO later. There are special designs they can use to try and ask the right questions and get real data. It's amazing all the things we think in medicine work that when you, look, when you look at them rigorously they may not work and to the future well the gene therapies are looking great in the mice um, and there are many different um, animal models now of different genetic diseases and last night I heard a beautiful talk on zebrafish uh, in the European meeting and um, there are really lots of ways we can look at these different therapies to see if they work but we also have to make sure we don't give our families false hope that they think you know this is going to be on their doorstep tomorrow because even with the Dravet children now that are being diagnosed in the last few months and I've said a few they they are looking at a few years away yet and maybe five or 10 years, I don't know, maybe it's three years, but we have to help them because they're very vulnerable and they want a normal trial as we all do. So um, it's exciting times and there's lots to be done. And I think that it's uh, the future is looking much more positive than it has ever looked. Um, and we need to bring this very clearly to our families. And in closing, I'd like to very much thank the fantastic team I work with. I'd like to highlight Sam Berkovic, who's led our epilepsy program until last year. He's still working in research and is as vibrant as ever. This is Heather Mefford, with whom I've collaborated for many years. She's just moved to Memphis from Seattle. And Steve Petru, whose work I showed you, and Joseph Getz, just to name a few people. I'd also like to thank my fantastic collaborators all over the world. Um, and in Canada in particular, Ken Myers, uh, who worked with me for two years and we're continuing to work together, which is a great joy. And finally, and, and most importantly, I'd like to thank the fantastic patients and families who've helped me with our research. Thank you very much.